I want to start out with some framing about what is it that motivates all of the projects we work on. Uh, because I think that's fundamentally important in the types of things that we're doing, is to make sure that we have a clear vision of why we're doing it. We're not just chasing after how to get more people to be using it, but we want to have a reason for doing that. And for me, at least, one of the core ideas is that our strong belief the success in the future won't be based on just what we know or how much we know, but our ability to think and act creatively. And in my mind, there's like nothing more important than that. And this is what leads to, it requires a fundamental rethink about what education is about. Because education today and parenting today generally is not focused on how to help young people grow up as creative thinkers. And in my mind, there's no question more important than that. Uh, we really need to have a big cultural change to rethink what it is about, you know, what, what we think it's important for children to learn, uh, to shift away from thinking about particular things they need to learn, to how to develop as creative thinkers. So if we try to focus on, well, what does it mean to develop as a creative thinker, to be able to come up with, you know, uh, you know unexpected or innovative solutions to unexpected problems. And this is increasingly important because the rapid change in the world we're growing up in a world where there is going to be uncertainty. Things will keep changing quickly. So it's always going to be important to be able to come up with you know, your own solution to an unexpected situation, because everyone will be faced with these unexpected situations. And one thing that we found is that if you want to help people develop as creative thinkers, the root of creative thinking is the ability to create. Again, there's more to it than that. But in my mind, if you want to just capture one thing that's important, is that if we give kids more opportunity to create, that's one of the best ways to start to engage them in creative thinking. So in a lot of our work, our goal has been to develop tools and toys that provide new opportunities for young people to grow up designing, creating, and inventing things. Um, and you know, to elaborate a little more on that, it's not just about creating. It's not just putting your hands on and doing it. Uh, but there's a whole set of things around the gravity. And again, even though this might seem obvious, take a look at most of the toys on the market today, most of the toys on the table there. They're not about kids creating. There are a lot of interactive toys. It's about kids interacting. And I make a clear distinction between creating and interacting. So we want to have kids creating and going through a type of cycle. This is the spiral that we, uh, that we think about these days. It starts out with imagining. You come up with an idea. You make something based on an idea. You create something. This means the physical world on the screen. Uh, think about creating broadly. It's not just about putting bricks or blocks together. You can create stories. You can create poems. You can create... You know, you know, things on the animations, create robotics, all these things are creating. After you create something, you play with it, you interact with it, you see what, how it works differently than you expected. You share it with others. Uh, you see how other people make use of it, how they react to it, they give you suggestions. They use it differently than you imagine. Um, you reflect on all of that. You think about how did this turn out differently than I expected. You know, you think about, well, the suggestions that other people give you, and then that gives you new things to imagine. So it's this ever-expanding cycle of having an idea, creating it, playing with it, sharing it, thinking about the experience, and that gives you new ideas. And the best learning experiences are always going around this cycle. So in our developing technologies, we're always thinking about how can we support the different parts of that cycle uh, to let people create and to build in all of the different support around the creative activity. So as many of you know, and as Warren mentioned, you know, I've worked for many years with the Lego company. We work with Lego on Lego Mindstorms. A couple years ago when I was here, I talked about an offshoot of the project that was still at MIT at the time, uh, but in the last two years it's actually become a product, and that's sort of this Pico Cricket Kit. Just wanted to give you a little bit of an update on that about what's happening with that. And again, the motivation for that was part of the, we're really excited that Mindstorms got out to the world. It's been very successful. Lego sold more than a million of these kits around the world. Lego design competitions are incredibly popular in many places. So this has been successful along many different dimensions, both commercially and also, I think, educationally. I think there's a lot of learning that goes on when kids go with mind storms. But there are some frustrations we had as this got out to the world. Although some kids get really engaged in robot design competitions, that's not what everybody wants to create. And we worry that this got out to the world, oftentimes, in a somewhat narrow way. And we think about it when we design different types of toys or tools one thing we do, and this, my mentor, Seymour Papert, we always talk about a low floor or a low threshold and a high ceiling. Something that's easy to get started with, you should do more and more complex things over time. What we've been focusing on in recent years is that this isn't enough. We also want to have what we call wide walls. And what we mean by that is there should be many avenues of entry. You shouldn't just be doing a limited number of things. 
that the tools should support you to do many different things to connect with the interests and backgrounds and passions of the great diversity of kids who might be using it. So we're really trying to focus on how do we reach a diverse collection of kids. And although MySerms does some of that, when I think it's potential to do more, the way it's gone out to the world, it's been used mostly for building robots for competitions. If you look at the after-school robotics, robotics clubs, even though there's big efforts to, make the, to reach out across gender lines, and most a third of the participants and most of them are, are girls. Uh, again, the girls participate, do great things, do wonderful things, enjoy it, but it really is very gender imbalanced. And again, the way robotics has gotten out to the world is this way, or even more so, I see this prop up here with Bex. I mean, take a look at this, and who do you think that's going to appeal to? Now again, it can be great for the activities with this, but it doesn't have wide walls. So with the cricket kit, we really want to make something that much wider walls. We want somebody who not just to let, let you make uh, a robot that moves around and follows a maze to solve some task they were given, but you also should be able to make things like this. I should be able to make a little hat like this, and then program it so that when I pet it, it pet and mouse. In this case, the kids built in a light sensor. There are rules that say, when the light level goes down, play the mouse sound. Uh, now again, what they're learning is the same as when you build a robot. With a traditional mobile robot with Mindstorms, you might say, wait until the touch sensor hits the wall, then back up and go and turn around. Here you say, wait until the light level goes down, and then play a meowing sound. It's the same logical, systematic thinking comes up, because we don't want this to be a watered down activity. It's really important it's not watered down, but to have multiple paths of entry. So you could do you know, everything from a cap and then take it apart. You still want things to move, but rather than just a traditional robot, you might want to make something like this. Again, that might not be easy to see in the back. You might make a little sculpture, and then the louder I talk, the faster they move. So in this case, it has a sound sensor, and the, the speed of the motor is based on the loudness of the sound sensor. So again, you're learning types of you know, logical rules, and actually exploring mathematical ideas about relations between speeds of motors and, and inputs from sensors, but doing it in a meaningful, motivating way, so it's part of a motivated play activity, uh, but gets kids engaged in all sorts of you know, important creative and systematic thinking. So based on these types of projects that we've been working on in our lab at MIT, we then came out with a product about a little over a year ago now that's a kit called the, the Pico Cricket Kit. It's from a company called Playful Invention Company. It's a Playful Invention Company. It's P-I-C-O, Pico, Playful Invention Company. And it's a kit that has some Lego parts, also has some arts and crafts materials to give a diversity of building materials, because for different projects, you want to have different types of materials. And then lots of different electronic parts. So you saw a light sensor, a sound sensor. There are you know, four different types of sensors. But in addition to motors, there was also you know, things to make sound and music, to have lights that turn different colors. So it's really playing, broadening away from just controlling a motor to drive a robot, to control music, light, sound, to reach more broadly to a wide range of kids. Um, so I guess we really, this is something that we've done in collaboration with the LEGO company. They've been supportive of this effort, but it's done separate from the LEGO company. Uh, again, great thanks to the owner of the LEGO company. You might know, LEGO is still a family-owned company. The owner is the grandson of the founder. Um, and LEGO decided, that the product people at LEGO decided not to make this a LEGO product. Partly it's not compatible with Mindstorms. Mindstorms is successful. They want to continue to push on that. As you might know, there's a new version of Mindstorms. It's called the NXT. It makes even, you know, especially focused on robot, mobile robot buildings. They're doing very well with that. They didn't want to do this, but the owner of LEGO was interested enough in this. They said, look, I'll help you start a company, put it out there, but then we collaborate with LEGO, that we get to use their parts, they can use the technology that we develop. So it's great that that's gotten out there, and we're starting to spread it in different places. We're working with computer explorers, you know, that's represented here, to get out there, and we're looking for, and it's getting out both from museums to, to homes, in a variety of different ways, starting to be used in schools. So again, if you'd like to find out more about it, I'd be happy to tell you more. Let me show you a few images of ways it's being used. These are a few images from work that we did in a workshop in Hong Kong. And it, to like, pause a moment, probably about a third of the sales of the product in the first year are in Asia. And I attribute that to the fact that this idea of the importance of creative thinking, I see as much more strongly understood and responded to in Asia. When I talk there, they really recognize there's a serious problem of a lack of creative thinking. And they see that as really you know, being a real drawback as, as students leave school and enter the workforce. 
So there's now pressure on trying to support more creative thinking. It's not an easy change. With the, you know, school systems everywhere, it's difficult to bring about change. But there's a real, it's really in the discourse there, much more so than in this country. So you know, there's a workshop in, in Hong Kong where they're using the crickets to make wearable devices. And this boy did a wearable jukebox that when you put in different coins, it plays different music. So he's a budding entrepreneur. This girl had lights that she put on her boots, so she was inspired by the way the lights on running shoes go, but she wanted to control the lights, so she programmed it for the lights to turn different colors based on how she was walking. She put sensors in her boots, had the lights light up in different ways. There's a workshop in Iceland where this was about inventions for the home was the theme of the workshop. So there's a room security system where there's you know, a light sensor when you break the beam, it sounds an alarm. There's a home invention, everyone needs an automatic toilet paper dispenser. So when you clap your hands, it automatically feeds out the toilet paper for you. This was my favorite. This was a, an alarm clock that had a light sensor. And when the light would hit the light sensor, it would turn on a motor to, to ruffle your hair and play music to wake you up. But after he did this, you know, someone saw it and said, but wait a minute, here in Iceland, we're so far north, the light usually doesn't come in the window in the morning. Uh, so he thought about it, and at the final exhibition, where they showed, the kids showed off their inventions, they all had posters, and at the bottom of this poster where he explained his invention, he wrote, for export only. <laughs> <laughs> and when he was he was thinking about his audience, which is an important part of kids designing and creating things, and think, who are you designing for? So it sort of engaged him in thinking about that. So again, we've been excited to get the over the last year, the cricket's out to the world, see lots of ways that the kids are creating things in the physical world. And it's a real contrast to a lot of the, again, electronic toys you see. You know, there's a growing number of toys and toy stores where there are, you know, cats that meow, but that's all that they do. You interact with it. And we want to make sure that the kids as the creators, because we see that's where the rich learning experience happens and how they can be sort of preparing them to become more creative thinkers. But of course, kids don't just create, in the, don't just interact and in create in the physical world these days. They spend a lot of time, as you know, just get talked about a lot of conferences like this, with interacting with media and dealing with things in virtual worlds and, and, and playing with media. And we want to make sure, again, the kids aren't just interacting with media, but creating with media. So that was sort of the inspiration behind work on the Scratch project that Warren mentioned. Because we want to give the same type of experience to kids have the physical world with crickets but let them create media in different ways. And again, have wide walls, let them create lots of different things, but also learn creative systematic thinking in the process. Again, we were inspired by you the last few years, since I was last here two years ago, there has been this you know, you know, surge of activity online in user-generated content. The sites like YouTube, Flickr, you know, blogging sites. It's probably true that two years ago, I bet you people in the room hadn't heard of YouTube. I think it's less than two years, certainly less than three years. But again, these sites are still very new. Now it seems like YouTube's been around forever, but it really is just in the last two or three years, there's been this explosion of letting people create things and put it online. Um, and we see that as a, I see that as a very positive trend of letting people create things and share it. Um, but almost all the sites that are up there with user generated content you're generating and sharing what I would call old media. In Flickr, you're sharing photographs. Phot photography is a, you know, it's a technology more than 100 years old. Even YouTube, video, is an old technology. What we want to do is let kids create interactive things, not just create you know, some linear narrative, which again, it's a good thing to do. We want to go beyond that to let them create the type of interactive things that they see online. So kids, you know, today they go along, whether it's a Club Penguin or a website where they move their mouse and, you see fireworks happening or playing a game and they move around. They're interacting with dynamic interactive media all the time, but they don't have much opportunity to create their own dynamic interactive media. So that's what Scratch was about. And we'd like to, you know, Scratch, someone called it the YouTube of interactive media. Where someone else on our, on our discussion board said, Scratch is what you, it, you know, it, it's YouTube if you don't have a camera. You know, so you, you, you can just you know, make your own interactive media, put up and share it. Um, so we put up a website, this went live in May, so it's about five months ago now, the middle of May, we put up a, not just a piece, it wasn't just a piece of software for creating it, but also an online community for sharing it. I think that was a really important part of it. And we've just seen how this community has blossomed over the last five months. Um, so right now, if you go to the Scratch website, which we'll do right now, So this is sort of live on the Scratch website. Actually, I'll first go to the homepage of the website. 
So on the website, like a lot of sites such as you know, such as YouTube and other sites like that, we can see the newest projects that came in, featured projects. It's now being used enough that the new project, there's a new project coming in on average one every two minutes. So it's getting used widely, lots of people. So if we, we'll come back a little while later, look at the three newest projects. They should be changed in, you know, in a few minutes. And featured projects, the most popular projects, again, as sort of standard for different sites. But then, if I see a project that I like, I can go and experiment with the project. Try to, I can just try it out right in the browser. So in fact, let me just show there's a project. I'm choosing this one, because this is one of the first. When we went live in the beginning, this is one of the first projects that, that it came up in the first few weeks. And it was one of the first ones that I just said, whoa. You know, there were a lot of little projects. And this is the first one I said, where someone was using it to go even further than what we had imagined. So this is done by a 13-year-old girl in Germany. So in fact, she has a voiceover in, in German. And the rules are moving the B with the cursor keys. So it's a combination of a story and a game where I'm supposed to get the grasshopper free. And there are all these different scenes about, you know, I'm supposed to open the flowers and get a key. So it's all the type of adventure game type things that you might see, you know, online. But it's letting the kids create games like this. So let's say another kid sees this, they play with it online, then they say, I want to make something like that. What they can then do from the website is they can just <coughs> click to download it, and they can open up on their computer and see how it was made, and then they can make modifications to it. So this, this Scratch software is taken from the website, the program that was made by the girl in Germany, bring it down to my computer, so all the behaviors are based on these building blocks. So you have this graphical programming language, and the blocks tell each of the objects what to do. So here's the B that's the main character in the story. If I want to make the B move, I can, there's a block that says move. If I click on this block, the B moves. The B has a couple different costumes with its wings up and down. So she made, there's a, a little paint editor, so she made two different pictures of the B, as you can see there with its its wings up and down. So then, there's a block that says next costume. So if I click on that, its wings go up and down. So one way she animates it is just to switch between costumes. <coughs> so she built up all these different rules over time, but then if you want to make use of it, you can just grab part of it, put it into your project. Or if you like the bee, but you don't want the whole story, you can just grab the bee and all of its behaviors come with it and put it into your project. So it's trying to be a new way of for kids creating things at lots of different levels or sharing them, whether you're sharing a whole project, a part of the project, some of the program or one of the characters, and share with one another. One thing we've been really happy about is that on the website now, there are about 40,000 projects that have been uploaded. And we look at it, more than 15% of the projects are remixes of existing projects. So it means that you know, roughly one out of six projects are ones that a kid saw a project they liked, downloaded it, made modifications, and uploaded it. Uh, so that's exactly the type of collaboration that we were looking for on the website, so it's been really exciting for us to see that that type of collaboration is going on. Of course, it leads to lots of discussion. In the discussion forums, there are a lot of kids say, you know, so-and-so took my ideas, so-and-so is using my project, and it leads to discussions, well, that's exactly what we want to happen, and it's not stealing someone's project, and uh, you know, if we want to make the culture of the website so that you then acknowledge people that, you, that, you know, that you've that made use of it. But even if you don't acknowledge it, the website now keeps track so in fact, you can see here, on this project, it says four remixes. So we keeps track of who remixed this project. So you can see who remixed it. And if you did one of the remixes, it will then say where it came from. So you can see where these came from, trace the roots of it, and go through and see all those different things. Um, let me just show a few types of examples of the types of things that kids have been creating. I just made a little gallery online here of some projects I want to show you. Some of the things they do are just recreations of sort of standard games. So you have some things on the site that take things like a Tetris game, again, which is just a you know, popular game, but then recreating it on its own. So I can now you know, move, the, move this around and play the game. Now this is one that's been very popular, there's a whole gallery around it, 
So again, you can see all the remixes. And this one says, you can see it was based on someone else's project. So I might want to go to that project. And I can see the early ones, like this one doesn't have color. So you can see the remix that I started with had color where this one doesn't. So you can see the way that things have grown by people taking projects and then enhancing. So that's one type of collaboration on the site. But there's another type I want to talk about as well. This, is, this was a girl in uh, England uh, put up a project. And this is, again, a use of the website we hadn't really thought about. But she, she put up this project. Um, and she said, here's some simple walking sprites. Sprites is what we call the characters. Each one with two costumes. They're perfect for games. And then she encourages other people to make use of them. So rather than putting up a finished project, she just put up some of her work and said, please make use of this. So after she had done that, a couple weeks later, or actually it's or a couple days later, around the same time, <laughs> someone said, thanks, can you make a mountain background for this game that I'm making? Someone made, put in a request for things that she could make. And then, this is sort of a revised version she made for this other game. Um, here's the other game that it got used in. So this was made by the other person. This was someone from Ireland. Sonic Pops is from Ireland, uh, who then made this uh, based on the characters that the, first, that the first girl had made. Once this game was up there, in the comments underneath, this is a boy in New Jersey, a 14-year-old, said, you know, do you think I could join? I'm a fairly good programmer. I could help debugging and stuff. Sonic Pops, who did the program, said, yeah, oh, sure, what you can be the programmer. Yeah, man, I'm feeling popular. So then he joined in. And in fact, uh, and then here you can see there's a new version of this, as it was done by Wodan, the boy in New Jersey, based on Sonic Pops project. Uh, as they started working together, they actually put up a website now called Crank Inc., where they're now featuring their game. So it's sort of <laughs> leaving the Scratch website, and they're featuring the games they made. So they have sort of their own company they're starting, you know, based on this. So the kids are really sort of working together in ways you know, that's, that's really pulling kids together. So there's a wide variety of different types of collaboration going on. Um, the Wodun from New Jersey, I think, is also someone who has really pushed the uh, uh, pushed the envelope in genres of how this might be used. I wanted to show another project that Wodun had created. So after working on those games, he then created this project called Wodun's World. Coach Live Wodun's Living is Wodun's World. Hi, I'm Wodun. You're watching the very first episode of Wodun's World. This is a show for you. Well, right, listen, but again, so this was sort of a, a talk show. Um, and, and based on this, you know, it's several episodes of different talk shows interviewing different people. Other people then sort of put up other news broadcasts based on you know they're being inspired by that. There was this project that another that someone else did that was inspired by Wodun's World. Uh, there was something called Scratch News Network (SNN), uh, where this one doesn't have the voiceover, it just has the voice balloons. And one thing that struck me is when I saw this, I thought, "Oh, isn't that nice? It's a simulated newscast." And then I called myself. I said. This is not a simulated newscast, this is a newscast. Because it's serving a community, it's news about the Scratch community. It's not a simulation of anything. This is news for the online Scratch community. And again, these are sort of uses of the site that we didn't imagine we put up there. And again, one thing that's exciting for us is to see the way that this continues to get stretched and being used in different ways. I just want to show one more example uh, from this 14-year-old, from again, Wodan, this 14-year-old in uh, New Jersey, we led then connected with his mother and found out more about him. She described him as a theater geek who had never done very much with computers uh, for of any programming at all, but he really enjoyed performing. So I think this connected with his theater interest was a way for him to get into computing. Uh, but then, this is, he had been, there was another girl online who was very impressed with what he had done and was concerned that, well, I can't really, I'm not very good at these sorts of things, I can't do it. So he'd given some reassurance to her, and then after he had given reassurance, she said, she put this up, this video, this video is dedicated to Wodan. It says, I'm here because Wodan told me to keep trying. I personally think I'll never be able to do, make something cool. There's Wodan, don't sell yourself short. So she's showing how Wodan had encouraged her online. Um, you can download things like this, see how it works. She says, oh really? So it's again, her like, you know, tribute to Wodan for helping her along. 
So again, kids are using this type in all sorts of different ways. And again, partly they use some of this expression because of some ways we purposely restricted the site. We, we do not allow direct email messages between members of the site because we want everything to be public to avoid the problems of you know, inappropriate things being done privately. So since we don't allow any private means of communication, it has to be public communication like this. Uh, so there's all sorts of comments and putting up projects in order to have that type of communication. There are a lot of challenges with this, how to deal with all the issues of kids communicating with each other, inappropriate content. You can imagine there's lots of challenges around all of it. But the things that we're, you know, we're continuing to deal with, and you know, so some of the ways we're continuing to evolve this site in ways to have a site where you can view only reviewed content. Like here's one of the challenges we're facing. Right now, when you make a project, on the menus, there's the standard menus like save and save as. There's another menu item that says share. And when you click share, it automatically, immediately puts your project up on the Scratch website. As you can imagine, that's incredibly exciting. You make a project, hit the share button, and all of a sudden you're one of the newest projects on the Scratch website. Of course, if you have that immediacy, it means there can't be any reviewing before it goes live on the website. So there's a tension there. Right now, we do allow things to go up, you know, we've gone on the side of immediacy, but there's some people, some teachers, some parents who don't want kids using it because there can be some inappropriate content with that immediacy. So we're in the process of making, uh, you can sign up for an account either to see only reviewed projects or to see all projects. So again, we're experimenting with different ways of dealing with this. So there are clearly challenges. That, again, it's not just us, everyone is dealing with these types of challenges uh, as they try to make these types of sites that have a lot of shared content. Uh, but again, these are things we work on. We're also working a lot on making this more international. You can right now, there's a language part of the menu here. I can change the blocks to any, any of these languages. So if I choose Spanish, all of the blocks change to Spanish. So I could write a program here, put it online, someone in Argentina could download the program, change the blocks to Spanish, and understand the program. And this is an advantage of these graphical blocks that, that, that easily translate it. We right now work on making it work on other character sets. Right now we don't have Hebrew, you know, Chinese, Japanese, Indian dialects, Arabic. So we're working on those because we want to make sure that this is something that can be a global community of kids sharing with each other. Let me just, uh, I want to leave some time for discussion, so I want to just wrap up by looking ahead at some other things. So I said, you know, certain things we're doing are, you know, working on, uh, you know, new ways of, supporting the community in different ways, the language side. We're also doing many other things. Like one is connecting Scratch to the physical world. This is a prototype, although we're making this prototype available already from the website, so people can get this prototype. It's what we call Scratch Board that connects the physical world to Scratch. So in some ways, it's a blend between the crickets and Scratch. So this, it doesn't control motors or lights. It just has sensors. So let me just show you an example of how it might be used. Uh, like here's a little project that I wrote. Uh, there's two fish, and in this one, it tells the fish, one of the fish swims around. Actually, I'll put it in full screen mode. Again, when it hits the shark, it's not very happy. But it's looking at the sound sensor on this board, and it goes higher if it hears noise. So if you make enough noise, we can keep the fish up high. So if everyone starts screaming out at the right time. Well, <laughs> so it can be good for audience participatory things. Uh, you can also use the scratch board in many you know, other ways. I can make my own musical instrument. So like, here's a popular way that it gets used. I'm going to open up a new project that I... So like, here's an easy... This is just saying... So it just has these... When I complete a circuit, it's just like play a drum sound. But I could, if I then want to make a random drum sound, I could just pull out a random block and say, pick a random number and play that percussion instrument. So you can get a wider range of different percussive sounds. So now, so it plays a different percussive sound each time. So this is the beginnings of it. I, can, I, can, I could build a whole drum around this. This is just the basic part of it. But I could put this in the mouth of the drum, put this in the head of the drum, and every time I hit it, the drum makes a different sound. Where I can make other musical instruments, like here, the other program I have, oops, 
That's not very nice. Sorry. This should. Oh, I turned off the sound. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what's going to. Let's not do that. But you can make other types of music instruments. What I was going to show was doing things. I can debug it later if you want to see. But you can measure the resistance of things, so you can like make instruments out of fruit because each fruit has different conductivity. So if I put these on here, each fruit will make a different sound because I can make different notes based on the resistance in the different fruit. So again, very easy to sort of connect to the physical world in different ways. So connecting the physical world is one direction I want to go, because again, this was brought up in several other presentations, the mixing of the, the virtual and the real, which again, we also agree, getting kids engaged in the physical world. Kids grow up in the physical world. They, you know, they have all sorts of intuitions about the physical world, want to play in the physical world, but then connect it back to the media and virtual world. So we think the scratch board is one way of doing that. Um, if I go back to the presentation, Another thing we're doing is we're working with some cell phone companies. Right now, I think it's challenging to do authoring of Scratch projects on a cell phone. The, screen, you know, the screens are pretty small. So what we're working with with these cell phone companies is you still create your Scratch project with the graphical blocks on a PC, but then you download it to your cell phone, and then you can send it to anyone else's cell phone. So it's like you know, instant multimedia messaging. So I can make a birthday card for someone, download it to my cell phone, send it to someone, they can then play with it on their cell phone. And the nice thing about cell phones is they have lots of sensors built in. You don't really need a scratch board. You have a camera built in in many cell phones. You always have a microphone built in. Uh, so you, could, you can make things that, that you know, you can, you know, whoever gets it can respond to it or interact with it with a keypad, with a microphone. Of course, there are all sorts of challenges because cell phones are non-standard platforms. And so it's, there are challenges of doing this in cell phones. So we're working with different manufacturers to do different things. Hopefully in the future there'll be more standard platforms. But again, it's a way of trying to expand to see putting this on different platforms. We're also putting on different types of, uh, you, know, you know, although it runs on Macs and PCs now, we're trying to get it running on newer computers, like people mentioned the XO computer from the one laptop per child, work on a version for that, for the Intel Classmate, try to get this on all different types of platforms. Another thing we're doing is to use the same programming box to control things in other contexts. So one of my graduate students is working on using scratch blocks to control characters and objects in Second Life. Um, so again, with a lot of these online immersive worlds, you go into the world, a lot of times, most of what you're using it for is just chatting with one another or interacting with things that are already there. Again, through our focus on getting people to create things, we really want these worlds to be places where people can create things. Even in worlds like Second Life, you can create structures but it's really, really difficult to create behaviors. And I think there's so much both learning opportunity and also play, play opportunity if you allow people to control the behavior. So in Second Life, you shouldn't just be able to build a house in Second Life, but you should be able to build a house where you can really write a little program with scratch blocks saying, if one of my friends comes to the door, the door should open automatically. If another person comes to the door to put down the iron gates or whatever it is I want to do, I just want to make my objects in the world react to things in different ways. So we're experimenting on Second Life, but obviously this could be in all different types of uh, you know, online worlds that come up. So this is a different form of collaboration. Whereas the Scratch website right now, you, I make a project and then someone else enhances the project. Here, if it's in a shared world, we can actually more talk to each other as we're making a project, or I can more easily you know, have a whole library project that people can then work with together right there online together. So I think there are different forms of collaboration that we want to be experimenting with. I was struck by the comment uh, earlier uh, about 2D versus 3D. You will notice with Scratch, we explicitly in our work with Scratch up to now focused on 2D worlds or sort of two and a half D in some cases. In our mind, that was a choice because we really want people to be able to create the things they do. And it's much harder to create your own 3D characters, where it's easy for people to create 2D characters, and it's easy to import your own characters. So like one thing you can do again, if I go to the Scratch on Scratch here, if I, uh, if I go to my own website here and say I want to, my website has a little, this little cartoon of myself, if I want to bring that into Scratch, I just take it from the website, drag it into Scratch, and now I'm in Scratch. So it's very easy to just drag different images so you can sort of take any content you want. And there's so much 2D content available that you can just grab, scan, grab the pictures, put it into, so we really want to get let everyone mix the different media they have in the world. 
In fact, even the name Scratch comes, if, if it wasn't clear, from the way that hip hop disc jockeys scratch with music. They use pieces of music and then put it together in different ways. Uh, and we want people to do the same with a wider range of media. So Scratch is intended to grab media in the world, put it together, make it come alive. And I think our long term goal is to make this the starting point for when people want to make dynamic, interactive media. So no matter what context, where they want to do, hopefully we've got sort of a standard way for people to learn to make it. Because the same way that with regular language, people learn regular language to write and read because it's useful in so many contexts. One reason it was that you know, a lot of past efforts of letting program, bring program language to the kids didn't really flourish just because it felt narrowed in. You could do a little thing, a little drawing with your turtle. Well, that's nice for a while, but you can't apply it in so many different ways. We feel that you know, we're making programming easier, but it's still not going to be trivial. It's still work to be able to do complex things. But kids are willing to do you know, hard work if it's something they're going to make good use of in meaningful ways. So we really want to make this new style of programming both accessible to kids and ways they can use it in so many different contexts that from all to know what they want to make, they'll be able to find a use for this and it'll be something that becomes part of the sort of common culture as kids grow up to be able to make their, the same way they learn to read and write, to be able to make dynamic, interactive things is just as important, uh, both for what they want to design in the world, but also in helping them develop as systematic and creative thinkers that they'll need to be to, for both success and satisfaction in their later lives. So thanks a lot. That's a little over you guys.